Before I joined AMSA, I was, I was at sea with BHP Transport uh, back in the day when BHP was, uh, had its own fleet, had a lot of ships, and uh, they took on cadets. And uh, unfortunately, the downside of that was that you got to see exotic places like Port Hedland, uh, Wyala, all those iron ore ports around Australia, but occasionally we got to go overseas and uh, Japan, Korea, uh, Philippines, and uh, New Zealand, surprisingly enough, was a really good place to go to. So uh, it was, it was, uh, yeah, it was exciting for a boy who'd never been out of New South Wales to go off and, and do that job, and um, yeah, really, really enjoyed it. Three cousins from my family first went out to sea, and they came back with uh, stories of a career that uh, was a nice blend with theory and practice, and of course, tales of adventure and um, excitement, and uh, I was hooked. The door swung open and it was the captain and the chief officer looking very shaken and visible and they said, oh third mate, third mate, you better come because the greaser's cut his thumb off and, uh, and I turned around and they had the, the young greaser there with a towel wrapped around his thumb and it was hanging off and so we had to race up to the medical locker and as a second mate on board the ship you're also well, the doctor along with a whole lot of other things on board, you're very multi-talented, you've done uh, lots of training, uh, four and a half years of training. Um, but this was a brand new ship and, uh, and I was a bit panicking as a, a young uh, second mate, third mate, and, and got up to the medical locker and the, um, I couldn't find the anaesthetic or anything and I, I found the, the needle and the thread and um, meanwhile I was sweating profusely and he, was, he had this bloody towel around his thumb and he's, he's mopping my brow with the other end of his towel and I'm digging in and and then sewing up his finger and it kept pulling through all the time, I'd have to go back in again and he had no anaesthetic and so he kept mopping my brow as I was sweating and uh, anyway, I got him all back together again, okay, and, um, and then the next morning I was on the bridge and uh, the captain came up and he said, oh, Mr. Prosser, you did a very good job of stitching up that greaser, uh, but the only problem is you didn't do individual sutures, you did homeward bounders all the way through like a blanket stitch. And, and I blame Sylvester Stallone because that's what he did on uh, First Blood on that movie that I was watching the night before. So, In India, um, it was just interesting because we had about seven days there, so sort of got to, to go up the road, as we say, and, and see some of India. But because we were there about a week, we ended up playing cricket against one of the local cricket teams. So we had our own sort of um, cricket competition, which was that was interesting as well, because on the way to India, we were practicing, getting ready for our big cricket game down in one of the empty cargo holds. So we were down there practicing our cricket, you know, with on steel deck plating, so you can get a fair bit of pace up. Um, so there were all sorts of things that went on in that trip. It was just, uh, it was a real eye out and very interesting. When I was able to go as a mass captain on a 300 foot sailing ship or a 100 meter sailing ship from uh, Newfoundland, Canada, below the Arctic Circle uh, to Ireland for two weeks under sail on a ship that was over 60 years old uh, in sea fog with whales and dolphins and icebergs, things that I don't think I ever see a combination of again. Making it to Ireland, the only day it was sunny is the day we uh, arrived in Ireland two weeks later. That trip probably is the most memorable. And I think one of the most memorable voyages when we went up to over 85 degrees north up in the Canadian Arctic. And we were doing some resupply and working at a place called Eureka. So the ship was in the ice for a number of weeks actually while we had scientists doing work ashore. And we got to know a polar bear quite well. And he would come up and visit and we would feed him apples. We'd throw apples off the back of the ship for them. And he'd sort of stretch up and try and get into us. But of course it was a big ship. We never really thought much about it, but when we got back off that trip and we put the ship in dry dock to, to check it out after the trip, we could see the claw marks in the hull of the ship. And the old man then said, never again are you going to feed polar bears off the stern of my ship. Um, my father was a lighthouse keeper, um, so I've always been involved in the sort of shipping industry, I suppose, from when I was about five years old and grew up in some of the remotest spots in the UK northern coast of Scotland. Um, loved the sea. Um, used to go down to the local fishing port and look at all the fishing vessels sailing in and out and imagine and a few of the little coastal traders were there and imagine the exotic places that they used to come from. I thought, yeah, I want to see a bit of the world um, and love the sea, so it was the job for me. So from 15, I was um, set on a career, a career at sea. Do it. Um, that would be my advice. Um, 
the fact is whether you, whether you join Navy um, or the merchant shipping world, um, or in fact go to sea with the oil and gas industry or, or whatever, um, there are career prospects there. There's enjoyment to be had. Um, there are skills to be learned. Um, I never let a winter or a summer solstice pass me by without recognising it because I'm a navigator. Navigators know where the sun is, they know what's going on because that's what we're trained to do. So learn many things about um, engineering. Um, if that's the world that you're in, you'll learn many things about um, navigation. If you're a deck officer at sea, learn to handle cargo, learn about workplace health and safety, learn a lot about people because you spend a lot of time with them. Um, and that can be exciting at a full career if you wanted, or it can be a start point that gets you experienced of the world and then you go off and do something else. But yeah, my core advice would be if you think you'd like to go to sea, do it. You start off on, in, in one area, but you, it allows you, it opens up so many, so many avenues, you know, and uh, so I, I'd say for, uh, for a young person today, um, those, those opportunities uh, still exist in the shipping industry, probably more so than what, than what I had, you know, so I would, I would encourage both, uh, both uh, young men and women to, to get involved with it, you know, so it's a great career. I don't, I don't, uh, uh, I, I don't regret a, a minute of it, you know, so. Uh, you'll be isolated from your family, friends, um, so you've got to get used to that, so you've got to be a bit independent by yourself, um, but saying that, uh, you still have that ever-changing environment. So you don't know what's going to happen on a day-to-day -day run within the ship itself, which is its own community, uh, but also within the environment and where you're going. It's absolutely an incredible experience to become a maritime professional. And when you start off with a career at sea, you get that background knowledge, you get that base training that you need throughout the aspects of the shore positions. There are so many opportunities once you have that career as a maritime professional. I never thought when I left high school and I went to Sydney, Nova Scotia to join the Canadian Coast Guard College that I would become a maritime professional in Australia. If you're considering a career at sea, obviously see how well you handle being on board a boat because you don't want to get too far down the track and then discover that actually the motion of the sea doesn't rest well with your particular system. Um, obviously it's, it's uh, a more remote kind of workplace. Uh, it's a workplace that means you're not necessarily going to have immediate connection to Facebook or, uh, or even email because um, uh, that has to be turned on via a satellite link because obviously there's no LAN connection. And, um, and so connection, whilst it's there, it isn't all the time. So it's not as easy just doing an update to your Facebook post and your friends know what you're doing or Vicky Verka. It, it's, uh, it can be a case of, I'll speak to you all in a couple of weeks when we get to the next port. And there's no issue with that as long as everyone concerned understands that that's what's happening and you haven't dropped off the face of the earth. I would think that um, while formal training has its place, uh, mentoring is something that junior seafarers should actively seek out and put in place because um, there's a lot to be gained by classroom education, but what a mentor can provide by way of practical real world hands-on training is, is not small. So my advice would be seek out a mentor and, and learn, the, the, learn on the job. Um, I think for, for anyone who is considering a career at sea today, um, give it a, a red hot go because um, it's a career that leads you on to other things. And, and the people in AMSA that I know that all had an interesting career at sea, you, you can come ashore at some point. Um, it teaches you so many things which are useful in later life and, and particularly as a marine engineer or any seafarer you, you learn that independence. Um, you, you're in a situation where there is no one else to go to, you're it. So you've got to learn to make decisions, learn to do things on your own. 
And you also learn to work with a close-knit team. They're, they're all valuable skills that you need later in life. And uh, I'd recommend the career to anyone who is thinking about it.